Okay. It's time for us to get started. Welcome. Thank you for joining Downey Brand, HT Harvey and Associates and Integral Consulting for this webinar on navigating California's unique legal permitting and environmental risks for offshore wind. I'm Megan Samaji, a partner at Downey Brand, and I'll be facilitating this webinar along with my co-host, Dr. Grace Chang, Senior Science Advisor and Technical Director of Marine Science and Engineering with Integral Consulting. California is a unique place to do business and it has unique challenges. And that's gonna be especially true for offshore wind projects that will touch ocean environments, landside environments, and particularly coastal areas and California's transmission grid. As our presenters are speaking today about these complex issues, please enter any questions that you have into the chat and we will address them during the Q&A session. If we could go to the next slide, please. But today we have four experts speaking on the broad range of issues that developers and stakeholders will encounter in studying, permitting, constructing, and interconnecting offshore wind projects in California. Our experts are Dr. Ian Vopero, Principal at Integral Consulting, Brian Craig, partner with Downey Brands, Dr. Sharon Kramer, Principal with HT Harvey and Associates, and Kristen Marsh, partner with Downey Brand. Next slide, please. We have provided our headshots so that you know who we are and how to say hello to us at the next conference that you see us. Um, so if we can advance our slides to the first presentation, I am very happy to turn this over to Dr. Voparel uh, to begin this discussion. Hey, Megan, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, super. Let me go, thanks. Next slide, please. Hello, folks. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to those on the West Coast. Uh, a, a couple of introductory slides about Integral, and then we'll get right into the meat of the presentations. Um, Integral is a mid-sized science and engineering consultancy providing strategy and project delivery for health, environmental, and natural resource challenges all across North America. Uh, Integral's got a long history of environmental contamination, remediation, verification, and alas, sometimes litigation experience all over North America. Uh, Integral has more than 200 employees, half of those with advanced degrees and certifications, and about half of those with PhDs. Uh, 35 or so are focused on marine science and engineering, and I joined Integral last year to lead business development for the offshore wind market. It's been fantastic. Uh, I had spent 16 years working for a major energy company on offshore oil and gas exploration, development, and operations, and so it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Next slide, please. <clears throat> A quick, quick view of the various offshore wind services that Integral offers. We serve clients that have a variety of different vantage points on offshore wind. We work with R&D agencies, regulators, developers, uh, very obviously with the major siting and permitting consultancies that many of you are familiar with, uh, and every now and then with investors as well too. And you can see some of our services listed here. Now we deliver specific elements of site assessment plans, construction and operation plans, working on six of the current East Coast commercial projects uh, and have historically worked on a couple of the research projects going on around the country. Now for this California audience, I wanted to mention my colleagues work developing a coupled atmospheric and ocean model to study the interplay of wind turbines and the wind energy areas off of, uh, 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 excuse me, the interplay of wind turbines and the wind energy areas on ocean upwelling and vice versa. And we recently published that paper in the Frontiers of Energy Research. Uh, Grace Chang is on the call, and uh, she's one of the authors of that paper, so save all your questions for her. And uh, let's jump right into it now, please. Next slide. So if we turn directly to the proposed sale notice, I'm sure all of you in the audience are aware of the proposed wind energy areas, one in the north called Humboldt and one in the south called Morrow Bay, which together offer five areas of potential sale. Now, of course, this leasing round is just the first step in this long, tortuous path that in my former job, we used to call first oil, uh, but I guess first electron is gonna be more fitting for this kind of business. Uh, and obviously these lease areas are in deep water, a good distance from shore, uh, 
likely have to navigate a lot of complicated seafloor, uh, likely have to navigate a complex landfall in areas where there's limited opportunities for construction and installation port infrastructure in particular. And there's a long literal path to the power market and the ultimate point of use at different load centers in California and the West Coast. Now, my colleagues are going to dive deep into a couple of these topics in their presentations. Now, clearly there are trade-offs to consider. This is already a grand portfolio of challenges to tackle by the winners of the lease sale. But the opportunity to gain a foothold in California's energy market with such strong aligned political support right now and potentially leading in the commercialization of floating wind in the US and perhaps worldwide is so attractive to many of you that I know have the vision and grit for the long game. Next slide. And I wanted to share a couple of the experiences from Deepwater Oil and Gas. You know, that grand portfolio of challenges I just mentioned very briefly already feels pretty meaty and hairy. You know, previous experience shows us that what we see now is really more just the tip of the iceberg for what it's going to require to develop offshore wind successfully. There are many unknown unknowns that only surface when we mature, and they often come from outside the basin experience of the project team. New communities become involved at late stages, interested stakeholders jump in and out of projects, uh, and the regulatory regime can shift. And so let me give a little bit of nomenclature that we used in the, the kind of the previous oil and gas industry. Uh, we talk about technical risks and non-technical risks. And I know you're all familiar with these in some way. This is just some way to kind of classify them and think about them in a strategic way. Now, technical risks are those associated with the defined scope of a project, right? So there are the detailed engineering and design. There's the construction and installation risks. There are the cable route selection. There are the beach crossing interconnection and transmission issues that you deal with. They're often tackled by a really professional group of scientists, engineers, lawyers, and others who can really handle that portfolio very attractively. Now, the non-technical risks arise from the interactions of that project and that scope with the external context and expectation, which is always changing. And that interplay between the technical and the non-technical isn't always obvious at the start. And it doesn't necessarily care about a developer's maturity of project engineering or whether or not they've just begun paying for construction activities. That mismatch in timing can play havoc with project economics and even the ultimate value of projects delivered. And what we found in the oil and gas industry anyway, was that the majority of project failures were due to those non-technical ramifications, not the engineering portfolio. And when I say project failures, I'm using a solid definition of project failure that's common in the project management literature. That's more than a year off schedule and 50% over cost estimate at investment promise. These are tough issues to solve and their importance in the portfolio has really highlighted over the last decade. Can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Thank you. I'm gonna let this up for a second. I wanted to give a shout out to Wood McKenzie for their recent report called Sea Change, which is about finding the capabilities and competencies that'll make success in the next decade of offshore wind opportunities. That was the inspiration for this slide, which you see here, and I borrowed a little bit and created a little bit of our own to make it site, you know, US specific, but uh, it's a great report and I hope you all get a chance to read it. Now, of course, BOEM and the industry have experienced these same technical and non-technical challenges together. And BOEM has begun to formally incorporate many of the non-technical issues into the leasing process, both as lease stipulations and also importantly, as evaluation criteria in the multi-factor auctions that we're now seeing for offshore wind. I'll just focus on one example. You guys can see some of my predictions of the future there too. Uh, Local content, right? Workforce development, infrastructure, and domestic supply chain investments, for example. Now, the winners of the Carolina Long Bay auction received a 20% bidding credit for local content with their commitments of $42 million towards that. Now, that commitment provided oversized value in the bidding process, recognizing that final sales were actually $315 million. So, great value for time there. 
Now, the proposed sale notice for California includes a local content credit like this and adds an additional 2.5% credit for a community benefit agreement. Now, CBA with stakeholders particularly affected by the potential development, directly affected by the potential development, particularly assisting fishing and related industries, helping to manage their transitions and gear changes that are more poignant because of the presence of offshore land. Of course, the California proposed sale notice has a number of lease stipulations as well. Things around transmission planning, protected and endangered species, uh, an intent towards project labor agreements, which I know many people are quite interested in, archeological survey requirements and stakeholder engagement and reporting requirements. Now, these are all the fundamentals of managing non-technical risks that happen outside better. Especially important in California, I think, is the plan and the requirement for engagement and involvement of native material tribes in the offshore wind developments. Let's go to the next slide. Now, after the sale, I'm sure the developers in the audience and on the line have their own frameworks to identify and assess the broad range of issues that are going to become specific to their projects. I adapted these themes and I've thought about a number of different examples from publicly available work from my previous career in the oil and gas industry. So post this California sale, five developers apparently are gonna sharpen their plans and tackle most of the examples listed here. The developers roadmaps of activity will clarify around key internal and external milestones. And uh, the regulatory ones are usually clearly defined, and so they're the easiest to put on the calendar. But the real opportunity is to front end load more of the work around these themes and these examples than has been historic practice in the energy industry. Indeed, more of the work than is regulatorily required by the agencies, federal, state, and perhaps local, that's been in practice for the energy industry. So let's talk a little bit about the interplay between the technical and non-technical. And I get to go first, so I get the, the easiest one, right? Next slide, please. Now, when a project is making a decision to select a foundation, it's going to require a certain type of mooring and anchoring system. And of course, we know it's gonna be floating in California. And that selection is going to cause a potential concern for impact to the seafloor potentially protected and commercially important species, maybe important habitats, depending upon what site surveys find out there. And that portfolio of interest can very easily highlight potential conflicts with other users, which may raise the political stakes from special interest groups who become concerned and involved in the project's fate. Now, the only way to solve these is to get in front of them well and sometimes the reprioritization of concerns can occur by finding things to work on together before all of this happens. Of course, community benefit agreements might provide additional financial incentive for those of us who have worked through these problems before the lease sale. So the sequence of these things doesn't always follow the milestones that a project identified. And the project may have a lot of development expense already out the door, but now finds itself on hold awaiting the resolution of potentially litigation, and that tends, to, that tends to eat up a lot of project value. So that was the easiest and obvious one. I'm glad I got to go first. And my talk is just the appetizer. I'm setting the table. My colleagues are going to share their expertise. It's more the main course for our presentation. So thank you very much. Let me turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Ian. I'm Brian Craig. I'm an attorney with Downey Brand. Uh, Downey Brand is a 95-year-old California law firm. Um, as relates to the basic topics, Downey Brand's attorneys are particularly strong in areas related to resource development, including land use, permitting, environmental assessments and litigation, energy, utilities, and regulatory compliance. I'm sure you're aware that there's been a lot of discussion about the challenges of citing offshore wind resources in the deep waters of the California coast. Uh, but I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing how to bring the energy generated by these turbines onshore for delivery to the transmission grid and ultimately to customers. As you might expect, delivering offshore wind energy in California raises issues that are different, very different from those encountered on the East Coast. Next slide, please. 
Uh, quickly, here are some of the players in the transmission planning uh, scene in California. First, the legislature sets policies and goals, including things like the renewable portfolio standard and um, zero carbon goals. The Energy Commission is the, sets the official demand forecast for California, and then it's also been charged with setting the offshore wind goals for California. The Public Utilities Commission develops a preferred system plan, which identifies the resources that are required to meet the demand and also the policies of California. And that plan is conveyed to the California Independent System Operator for use in its plan transmission planning process. The California Independent System Operator conducts an annual plan transmission planning process that specifically authorizes transmission projects needed for various reasons. And I should mention that the California ISO is not a state agency, but it does the transmission planning for the bulk of the state, about 80% of the state. Uh, as relevant to our conversation today, the CAISO service territory does not include Del Norte County, which is in the very far northwestern part of the state, or Los Angeles, the area served by Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And finally, the governor, uh, Governor Newsom, is not shy about weighing in on various policies and goals, so he has a role in this as well. Next slide, please. All right, can we get to the next slide? Well, I'll start talking and maybe we can catch up. Uh, one key question for transmission planning is how much capacity should be planned for. Um, and the slide that should be showing up right now has a couple of different forecasts. Uh, the, there we go. The Energy Commission has been uh, charged with defining the maximum feasible capacity and it recently came up with a recommendation of 25 gigawatts by 2045. I should mention that the maximum feasible capacity is described as being potentially achievable, but aspirational. Uh, in the, the Public Utilities Commission and its recent preferred system plan came up with a much more conservative estimate, 1700 megawatts by 2032. That's based on the existing transmission system with no upgrades and an initial assessment of early commercial interests in the area. The, the CAISO is currently in the midst of its 2022 to 23 transmission plan process. Uh, that looks at 10 years and tries to identify the transmission resources that would be, necess be necessary. The CAISO for its base portfolio is using the 1700 megawatts that was referred to it by the uh, PUC. And if you look at the uh, breakdown there, only 120 megawatts is coming from the Humboldt area. Uh, Humboldt area is one of the, the best resources, but the transmission there is so limited that only 120 megawatts can be uh, transmitted at this point. Uh, the transmission plan is not considering energy from the Iowa Canyon call area. There's no auction scheduled for that area currently. And it assumes that the Diablo Canyon power plant will retire in 2024 and 25 as currently scheduled. Uh, in addition to the base portfolio, the PUC and the Energy Commission have asked the ISO to study a high transportation electrification scenario, which would include about 4,700 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, this map is a little bit hard to read, but it identifies the existing call areas that, that um, Bohm has, has identified, Humboldt in the far north. You can see there are additional areas of interest, the Del Norte to the north of Humboldt and the Cape Mendocino to the south. In the central coast, uh, currently the Morro Bay call area is the only one that will have an auction. Um, uh, so the Diablo Canyon call, call area is not assumed to have any deliveries at this point. I'd like to make a couple of points while the slide is up here. First of all, the wind areas, the wind resource areas are very far from the load centers. If you look at Eureka in the north to San Francisco, which is sort of the next large um, load center, the distance is about 230 miles, which is about the same distance as Washington, D.C. to New York City. Uh, in the south, in the central coast area, San Luis Obispo to Los Angeles is about 160 miles. So 
regardless of how things develop, the transmission is going to have the energy from wind, offshore wind is going to have to be transmitted long distances to reach actual load. Uh, second thing I'd like to point out is the existing transmission grid, which is shown by all these yellow and red lines uh, on your screen. Uh, if you notice, a lot of the transmission is focused, especially the north-south spine, is focused in the eastern side of the Central Valley, uh, far from the coast, 100 miles or more, at least in the northern part of the state. Uh, there's very little transmission near the humble call area. You can see there are two faint uh, lines right coming from Humboldt heading east. And right below that, there's a complete blank. There's very little transmission in that area. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, CAISO's 2022 23 transmission plan has a base co case that assumes only 120 megawatts from Humboldt, as we described. But the CAISO also recently did a 20-year transmission outlook looking a little further out than the transmission plan and did a, an assessment of what it would what the transmission resources that would be necessary to convey 1.6 gigawatts from, from Humboldt to the transmission grid. The, and we came up with three different options. Uh, first option is uh, 120 mile, two line, 500 kV, a uh, line from Eureka, which is near the north coast. I can't quite control the, the cursor here, but uh, you can see where the north coast wind circle is. Directly across that dotted line is, is represents that line. Uh, that would require an additional upgrade from Fern Road uh, south to Tesla. The second option is an undersea cable, a DC cable, directly from the north coast to the San Francisco Bay Area. And the third option is a sort of an overland DC line from Eureka directly to the Bay Area. Uh, the northern North Coast wind areas are actually great resources. They have capacity factors in the high 40% and at times over 50%. They have strong generation at night when the solar generation shuts down. They have strong generation during the summer when demand is high. And they have the largest potential capacity, about 14.4 gigawatts, as opposed to about 6.7 gigawatts for the central coast. But as you can see, as we saw in the last slide, it also has the least existing transmission. If you look at the cost estimates over on the side there, uh, for this for 1.6 megawatts, the estimated transmission costs are between 2.3 billion and 4 billion. Uh, that's an awful lot of transmission costs for a relatively small amount of generation. And if these added lines only serve 1.6 megawatts, they could be very, the transmission could be very expensive. So the question is whether additional megawatts will show up if transmission is improved in that area. Next slide, please. Uh, this gives you a little bit of idea of the terrain in the North Coast, the northern half of the state. If you're not familiar with California, you may have an image of the coast of California that's derived from the southern part of the state where there are relatively flat land sloping to broad beaches, uh, the Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego area. But once you get a little bit farther north, things get a lot more rugged and very different. Uh, just north of Morro Bay is the Big Sur area, which is very remote and uh, where the highway slides into the ocean every once in a while. The coast is kind of characterized by steep mountains uh, sloping steeply into the into the ocean. Uh, there are very few ports, um, very little population. Um, once you get north of, of uh, San Francisco, for example, the, the population centers are, are few and far between. Um, Eureka, which is probably the metropolis of the north, has a population of about 27,000. Uh, few, little population means little load, which means little transmission. If the first option we described earlier is built, that's the, the transmission line from Eureka, which is just that hump on the left there is Cape uh, Mendocino. Eureka is just north of that, more or less straight across to the east side of the Central Valley. Um, th that would involve crossing mountains, um, uh, rivers, Wilderness, national forest, 
state and national parks and other protected land. So there'd be considerable challenges building a line like that, or even expanding the existing right of way of the two transmission lines that are already there. Next slide, please. Uh, the options for the Central Coast are a little bit better, just because there is more transmission there. Um, the, the CAISO's current transmission plan assumes that all Morro Bay generation comes on shore at Diablo Canyon. The existing 500 kV system in that area can handle about 5,300 megawatts. Uh, the CAISO is currently assuming that Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant retires its schedule. If more than 5,300 megawatts of capacity is needed, the CAISO has identified three options. One is an undersea DC line directly to Southern California. Uh, second is a, an additional uh, 500 kV line at the, uh, in addition to the existing Diablo Gates uh, line. And the third option is a direct DC line under sea north to Moss Landing, which is on the fringe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think California has tremendous offshore wind potential, as we've been discussing, but developing the best resource areas will require significant and expensive upgrades to the transmission system, especially the transmission system serving the North Coast. Uh, because of that, the early development might favor central, the Central Coast just because there is, is existing transmission there. And that will be particularly true if the Diablo Canyon retires as scheduled so that we can use the the uh, substations and transmission capacity that's currently used by the power plant. Uh, I think the challenge facing California will be the coordination of the development of offshore wind generation and the transmission needed to convey that to customers. It's not exactly a chicken and egg situation. It's more of a situation where three, two or three eggs have to hatch at exactly the same time and the resulting chickens have to reach maturity at exactly the same time. It's going to be an interesting process, and it'll be uh, a lot of fun seeing what happens in the next few years. Uh, next slide. I think the last, my last slide is just a, I, I, I'm going to ha thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand you off to Dr. Sharon Kramer. Thank you again. Thank you. Let's see, here we go. Yeah, that was great, Brian. Really appreciate it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our ecosystem and potential environmental interactions with offshore wind. And uh, first, can we go to the next slide? Um, I am sitting actually in Humboldt, um, just north of Eureka. And um, I work for HT Harvey and Associates, and we are an ecological consulting firm. We are a Bay Area. We were founded in the Bay Area, and we have um, about 80 plus ecologists, landscape architects, and others. And, four offices in California, including Humboldt, um, and one office in Hawaii. And I guess I uh, wanted to just say our experience in marine renewable energy has been since about 2007, working on primarily wave and tidal energy on the West Coast, which is what we've uh, had experience with or what has been uh, developed on the West Coast, including fairly recently the permitting uh, for the Oregon State University's PacWave South, the Wave Energy Test Center off of Newport, Oregon. So um, that was successfully permitted through a multi-year process. So we pretty much have um, sunk our teeth into every West Coast project that has to do with marine renewable energy. And I'm very excited about offshore wind and taking our experience and applying it. Can we go to the next slide, please? And we have a pretty good team, pretty strong team. Uh, lots of PhDs, as Ian mentioned about um, working with Integral. Um, I lead the uh, marine renewable energy team, and then we have several avian, uh, marine mammal, sea turtle, regulatory specialists, um, uh, modelers, uh, quantitative ecologists, and so we're a pretty extensive ecological team. Can we move to the next slide, please? So what's different about the California current? I'm going to kind of contrast, compare contrast to the East Coast. Um, our California current ecosystem, which is more than just California, it's really the West Coast uh, of the US. The whole West Coast compared to the East Coast is, has a very narrow shelf, continental shelf. So um, that translates into a lot of things, but basically deep water is, is very cl is closer to the coastline than it is, say, off the East Coast where the continental shelf is very broad. 
We're also an eastern boundary current, which is the California current ecosystem. And our um, California current is very much um, uh, a strength of it is really that we are we have a lot of wind forcing from the north. And that bottom slide actually comes from the study that Ian mentioned that Grace is the author on uh, about the upwelling study with offshore wind. But the wind blows very strong, and Brian mentioned that too. And what happens then is, is, is the movement of surface water from the coast offshore. It causes that, that movement. And that it was replaced in turn by coastal upwelling. Water from deep uh, moves up to surface water along the coast, up to the surface along the coast, brings with it an incredible amount of nutrients uh, and all the things that, that fall from it. We have an incredibly bountiful uh, area where animals come from all over to forage. And that's important when we start to look at uh, how offshore wind and um, affects the ecosystem, or in particular, how how the species that we expect to occur with the different parts of an offshore wind project. So let's go to the next slide. So again, I, I alluded this, and, and I share again the proposed lease sale areas off of um, Humboldt and Morro Bay, uh, as you've seen the slide before. But you know, uh, offshore wind development, and I'm not going to get into the uh, land transmission, and we have done work on that with respect to a study we did with Cal Poly Humboldt uh, and the feasibility of, of development off of Humboldt. Um, but I'll focus on the coastal pieces, the ports, the near shore, and the offshore wind energy areas. And just call to your attention that we have really different habitats, and they support very different species assemblages moving from onshore to offshore. And not only that, but we're going to have a, obviously really different activities occurring uh, in each of these zones. And so the impacts of a project to the um, to the organisms that live there are going to be quite different. So in the ports, we'll have our uh, port infrastructure needs, upgrade needs, and wind turbine construction that'll occur in our ports. And there's a very different suite of species, especially, for example, uh, in our bays, and ports where we have shallow water, mud flat habitat, eelgrass habitat, uh, very different assemblage of species, bird species, et cetera, fish, uh, then as we move further offshore. So when we move into the near shore, we've got subsea cable transmission, um, so transmission cables and vessel traffic. And we the near shore is primarily where we're gonna have strong interactions with fisheries. Um, and we have a whole different assemblage of, of birds, marine mammals, as we move further offshore. And I'll, I'll provide a little more detail in a minute. Uh, and then the offshore wind areas is where your turbine array is going to be. And that obviously is going to have different effects than the subsea cable and the port upgrades. So let me touch a little bit more on how these habitats and areas parse out with respect to species and their distribution. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. So the slide on the left is um, some work we're doing with Cal Poly Humboldt to develop a seabird um, 3D model to look at the vulnerability of seabird species with respect to offshore wind turbines. And so what we're doing is using a 40 plus year data sets of databases, multiple databases. And this is just a quick snapshot of all the seabird surveys that have been done through those efforts. And now we're integrating them and looking at the birds um, that we see with respect to how they use the space in two dimensions and adding their information on how they also use it in three dimensions. I'll touch on that a little bit more. But the reason I show this slide is to provide you with a, just a very high level overview of the onshore offshore gradient in, in estimated seabird density. And close to the coast, you see the reds, the hot colors because seabirds are very, very high density closer to the coast. And as you move further offshore, they're lower density of seabirds, but not even just the density, but the species assemblages are quite different. Um, and we'll touch on why that's important in a minute. And likewise, you know, fisheries, so on and so forth, it, they all do change as you move onshore to offshore. But a quick example for uh, cetaceans for marine mammals is to just look at this graphic from uh, comparing sperm whales and humpback whales. And even more dramatic would be gray whales, which migrate very close to the coast. But sperm whales are more are denser, the hotter colors offshore than they are near shore, the cooler colors. Whereas humpback whales are more uh, are denser near shore and less less dense offshore. So you see, we're going to run into different animals depending on where we are uh, onshore to offshore. And let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> 
And it's not just the uh, spatial distribution changes. I'm showing this slide because this is a, a kind of moving image, if you will, the dates change of the 17.5 degree centigrade isotherm as it moves across seasonally across the Pacific towards the California coast. And why do we care about that? Well, it, as, it, as it moves closer to the coast, we see a different change in species assemblages as well. And that's, that's, that gives you a sense of the seasonal variability. There are many other seasonal issues, but this is one that's fairly dramatic if you like to eat albacore tuna, because that's what we typically call the tuna water. And the tuna come across uh, with that 17.5 degree C isotherm. So we do see a very seasonal change in abundance and also see interannual changes in abundance and distribution. So there's multiple levels of variability that we have to take into account. Let's go to the next slide. I alluded a little bit to our Seabird 3D model that we're working on with Cal Poly Humboldt, the Schatz Energy uh, Center. And what we are looking at again is in 2D, I showed that other graphic, how seabird density changes, but not all seabirds fly at the height of the rotor swept zone. And seabirds do use the windscape, you know, to um, some seabirds use the windscape and they, they take during the high wind velocities, they'll fly high up, they'll soar high up into the airspace and then glide, they'll soar long, long distances. And we're talking species like albatrosses, which um, nest way far, don't even nest anywhere near California. They nest in Hawaii, Japan, and other um, far away places, but they'll come to our area to forage. And so they do that energetically by using, again, the wind, the strong winds to fly very high and then soar and glide long, long distances. And so these are the birds that we're looking at that may be more vulnerable to collision with turbine blades. And we're doing, um, like I say, we're developing a model to look at which birds may be more vulnerable under what different seasonal wind conditions. So um, hopefully we'll have that work completed towards the end of the year. Next slide, please. And another concern that has um, come up with respect to cetaceans, whales on the, on the West Coast is, is how they may interact with all the moorings. Floating wind turbines have a lot of infrastructure below the water. And so that uh, that is a really critical piece because we just don't know how our cetaceans will interact. And just for scale, there's a humpback whale in the image, and it just shows you how large the infrastructure will be, the subsea infrastructure. And this is something that's an unknown, one of the unknown unknowns, is not so much the whales and their collision with the moorings, which will all be fairly large structure, large, large cables, but um, potential for secondary entanglement with lost fishing gear. And lost fishing gear is a well-known um, uh, issue with respect to cetacean entanglement. So this is something we don't know and we'll have to do studies and, um, and we won't know until we put structure in the water. Next slide, please. And the last slide I have ecologically is, and again, on the left, I'm showing uh, an image from the study that Integral did on um, effects of offshore wind projects on wind forcing and wind speed changes. And so the changes uh, from before and after a project are what's noted. And it's a great study. I encourage everyone to look, take a look at it. But how does that translate into ecology and ecosystem multi-trophic level interactions? Uh, we don't know. And that's something that's really exciting. And we're hoping to do more work in that area. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And I'll leave you with a few uh, studies. Um, I guess the folks that get this uh, will have this available to them. Um, and the next slide then. I'll transition it over now to Christian. You can tell us what this all means for permitting. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's uh, just fascinating. Um, I love to see that background and, and it's, it's a great backdrop for, for my presentation as well. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So I, I'm gonna, transition a bit and um, the obviously the federal agencies in BOEM have um, you know a lead role the lead role in the offshore uh, uh, wind space uh, at least uh, beyond the three nautical, nautical mile um, uh, limit for California's uh, coastline uh, 
Uh, however, there is uh, a really strong involvement of the various California agencies. And so I really wanted to focus my presentation more on those who may be uninitiated in California to the, the panoply of agencies and regulatory authorities uh, that will come into play as each of these projects is being developed. And I should also note that uh, there are some, uh, a couple of projects now that are in the application phase in state waters. And so uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see if we see some offshore wind that is closer to shore and uh, is administered by the California State Lands Commission rather than uh, just BOEM. So here is just a, a list of the key uh, state and local agencies that are going to be involved in in uh, all aspects of offshore wind uh, from uh, the California Coastal Commission, which has its consistency authority under the CZMA, uh, which is uh, quite significant because it allows them to comment on some of the leasing um, that occurs out in the, uh, the uh, uh, federal waters, but also California State Lands Commission is going to have a really significant role because of their sovereignty and ownership and administration uh, over tide and submerged lands within state waters uh, and also their, their primary administration over the public trust doctrine, although uh, both uh, Coastal Commission, Fish and Wildlife and, and other agencies do have uh, public trust obligations, state lands has really been tasked with, with the, uh, the lead on public trust issues. Um, you, of course, have uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, which it administers the California Endangered Species Act and uh, also the Fully Protected Species Act, which I'll talk about uh, momentarily. Uh, I'd also note that they um, also administer some of the coastal programs for fisheries and uh, for marine life protection. So the, they have a very strong role as well. Um, and then not to, to diminish the role of uh, ports, counties, cities, and other responsible and trustee agencies, uh, something that I'm not sure is carried over in a lot of other coastal states, but certainly is a big feature here, is that local jurisdictions do also have authority uh, under the Coastal Act and may issue coastal development permits for onshore development uh, within the coastal zone. Um, we've got one major infrastructure project now that has four independent jurisdictions all uh, uh, involved in a, in a single coastal development permit for that infrastructure. And so you start to think about offshore wind and you're going to have a number of, uh, of responsible agencies uh, for coastal as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then, uh, just in terms of NEPA and then California's uh, equivalent, the California Environmental Quality Act, of course, uh, we also uh, wanted to be strong in our uh, administration of environmental laws, but also but have to do it slightly differently, which we seem to do uh, on so many levels here in California. And so uh, we, in addition to the NEPA process, these offshore wind facilities are going to have to go through the CEQA process. And there are some important differences uh, where I think NEPA has been uh, primarily procedural or viewed as, as a procedural document. CEQA has some additional teeth and it actually requires a finding by the, the state or local agency, whoever this is the, the lead agency for, for the CEQA document to uh, uh, find that mitigation measures or alternatives have been adopted that avoid impacts or, or lessen impacts to less than significant. Or if they can't do that, they need to, to adopt a statement of overriding considerations. You don't have that equivalent under NEPA. Uh, some other uh, areas where there are some differences. For example, uh, I want to highlight the proposed project and alternatives. Um, and this is a, a question I get often from clients as to you know, what level of detail we have to provide on the proposed project and alternatives. And then in some cases, do we want to just put up alternatives and not have to deal with a proposed project or single project. Well, in California, it's different. Uh, for NEPA, uh, the NEPA document has to address all of the alternatives in the same level of detail. That's not true in California. The, the, the alternatives to the project can be in less detail. Uh, but under NEPA, you also do not have to identify the proposed project and uh, the preferred alternative up front. You can present the alternatives uh, and then pick a preferred alternative later. 
that is very different in California, particularly after a recent case, Washoe Meadows, which essentially found that that under CEQA, it has you have to identify the, the proposed project and uh, and its alternatives. Um, the uh, the other thing is on the scope of review, which I found very interesting. Um, federal agencies sometimes will view their scope a little bit more narrowly. Um, that is not true for state agencies. We have a pretty uh, uh, a pretty robust set of cases surrounding um, the need to address uh, foreseeable uh, and indirect impacts. Uh, in this case, it was it was interesting to listen to the uh, Coastal Commission consistency determination. Now, I realize this was under the CZMA, but uh, BOEM took a narrower view of the impacts of its leasing initial leasing decisions related to exploration uh, where the Coastal Commission really looked at it more broadly and that's just one example. Last thing I'd note here is in litigation uh, in at least in California there are a lot higher volume of cases dealing with uh, challenges under CEQA and those cases tend to or the courts tend to give less deference to California agencies and so uh, the litigation is quite robust here in the state. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other compliance uh, considerations for CEQA, and you know, I've heard some of these issues discussed, and I don't know uh, to what extent uh, BOEM and some of the other the state leads have have resolved some of these issues, but the questions have arisen about whether you do some of these with joint and independent review whether you do uh, programmatic versus project level review. Um, there, I'll just note that uh, under state law, uh, while uh, programmatic level review is an option, you have to be careful not to, uh, to avoid providing the level of detail necessary to address uh, specific project impacts. Uh, so that can sometimes be divergent. Uh, we also have, uh, we, confusingly, uh, some agencies don't, have to follow CEQA. They have their own CEQA equivalent process or certified regulatory program. Coastal Commission is one of those. And so, you know, it, if uh, if it is undertaking its review, certainly they can rely on a CEQA document prepared by others, uh, but uh, they have their own process, which makes it even more challenging. And then uh, next slide, please. Lastly, just a couple of areas that I thought were pretty unique to California and that uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, robust activity on among the various agencies. Uh, first is, is we have a statute or a series of statutes that protect, that fully protect certain species that have been identified by the legislature. Uh, uh, some of those include the, the condor, least tern, the brown pelican, uh, northern elephant seal, et cetera. And under the fully protected species statutes, there is no incidental take authorized. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, this creates a, a, a heightened need to avoid a take, to avoid the impact. There, there is a particular exception where you have a natural communities conservation plan, but um, but that's a pretty rare exception. I don't, I haven't heard anybody talking about using an NCCP here. Uh, tribal consultations in California have also uh, really become important, a critical step. And uh, with Assembly Bill 52, uh, agents, state agencies, local agencies have to undertake early consultation as soon as they've decided to, um, uh, to review a project. And there are actually some uh, robust requirements mandating uh, negotiation on mitigation strategies early in that process. So that's going to be important. Um, we've seen a lot of these agencies adopt uh, major policies in the last few years on environmental justice and addressing disadvantaged communities. And, and that can be interpreted very broadly and uh, can involve uh, uh, connections or access to public trust lands. Uh, and some of those agencies include the Coastal Commission and State Lands Commission. And so that's going to also play very, very heavily. And then under the California Public Trust Doctrine, uh, there, too, we've seen uh, a lot more activity, both among the agencies, but in court. And, uh, you know, based on the uh, seminal case, uh, the Supreme Court decision, the California Supreme Court decision, National Audubon Society, uh, 
the state has been have found to have an affirmative duty to consider the trust and to protect public trust uses whenever feasible. Now, public trust uses include commerce, fisheries, navigation, but, but also recreation and preserving land and its natural state, so the environment. And that affirmative duty has been held to require, you know, essentially on the record findings and analysis. And uh, and uh, I think a higher obligation now to to really evaluate uh, the impacts on the trust and uh, try to protect those uh, those trust uses and values whenever possible. Uh, next slide, please. And that's essentially my presentation. I'm going to head, hand it back to Grace Chang and Integral and to my partner, uh, Megan Samaji, uh, to handle any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. We'll have the, everybody turn their cameras back on and address some of the great questions that we have gotten in our chat. Uh, the first one, I assume, is for Brian. Is the CAISO considering transmission from North Coast offshore wind farms up to Oregon? Uh, the CAISO is not currently formally considering that. Uh, the current transmission plan is focused primarily just on its uh, control area, which does not include uh, even the very northern part of California and certainly doesn't include Oregon. But well, I have heard that there are discussions looking at the option. And in light of the difficulty of connecting transmission in other directions, that seems to be uh, an area that's worth looking into. Thank you. And I'm going to um, skip slightly out of order here in the chat um, and raise the question, uh, which is a fantastic question and is really sort of the, the elephant in the room around offshore wind development, at least in the Central Coast, is what happens if the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant doesn't cease operations um, in 2024 and 2025. And by way of background, why that is such a, a huge unknown, um, in terms of infrastructure, the plant has existing 230 and 500 kV transmission lines. Uh, they're located just outside the coastal zone, but still pretty close to the water. And the plant obviously has to stop operating before those transmission lines become available. And when that happens, they will be more precious than rubies in California. Um, you know, any interconnection to those lines is going to require coordination with Diablo Canyon's physical decommissioning process. Um, in addition to all of the independent permitting obligations that developers are going to have to make that interconnection, uh, permitting is going to be a challenge regardless of this Diablo Canyon X factor. You've got the coastal zone, uh, the Diablo Canyon lands are very culturally and historically important to the northern Chumash tribe. And because PG&E is a California Public Utilities Commission jurisdictional um, utility, the CPUC has a tribal land transfer policy that mandates that the tribes receive a right of first offer for any utility property that is being taken out of use. And then of course there are sensitive species and environmental issues both on the water side and on the land side. Um, and I'm sure we could all spend an hour here talking about that. Um, we're hearing rumors that the governor's office is going to be pushing for a five-year extension of Diablo Canyon. Um, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission traditionally issues 20 and 40-year licenses and license extensions. Um, and it's really not clear at this point if Diablo Canyon's extension for even five years is going to trigger some very substantial um, seismic upgrades that need to happen, which will cost, you know, a couple billion dollars, at least, I think was the last estimate. Um, and, you know, if, if the cost benefit doesn't pencil out in the short term, does that mean keeping the plant online for a full 20 year relicensing cycle? And so there there are an extraordinary number of potential knock on effects from keeping the plant online. Um, and I think, you know, there's options for, for each of our speakers to sort of provide some of the key concerns or considerations you see with keeping the plant running. So I'll, I will turn it over um, 
to whoever raises their hand first. And that'll be Brian. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the transmission, uh, the CAISO has uh, earlier uh, suggested that there could be a 500 kV substation installed at Morro Bay. Uh, Morro Bay used to have a power plant there, so they're all used, I think, a 230 kV transmission, uh, substation and transmission line. You can upgrade that or install another 500 kV substation. Pr probably have to add a 500 kV line inland, but at least in the short term, you could probably figure out a way to get the transmission, at least from the Morro Bay call area, into the system. And, right. Yeah. Actually, Megan, in the interest of time, we've got about five minutes left. There are some questions that are directed at Sharon specifically and at Ian. Maybe we can just have you answer in the chat and then can follow up over email and then we can have more of a panel discussion for, for broader questions. Um, does anyone else have responses to the Diablo question? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan, that was excellent information too. Uh, Christian, we've got a really quick question for you about the permitting, what about the Army Corps? I think it did not appear on your slides. I'm sure it's an important <laughs> issue there. Right, no, I, and I wanted to, to just emphasize that there are a number of federal agencies, Army Corps, BOEM, um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fishery Service that I didn't list. I was really trying to make the, the presentation more California-centric as to the supplemental agencies you're going to be dealing with. Obviously, we're going to have the, the entire panoply of agencies from the federal side that we've been dealing with on the on the East Coast as well. So absolutely. I think and this next question, it was directed to Ian, but I think you know there's some some really broad applicability for all of our um, audience members today. So Ian, if you could address the similarities, if any, in the quote traditional risk exposures that affect offshore oil and gas operations. Um, compare that to some of the risks that you're seeing in the emerging offshore wind market. Yeah, super. Uh, thanks for the question, and uh, Megan, thanks. And definitely want to open this up more broadly to risks in a second to the rest of the panelists. Let me give a quick <laughs> kind of quick perspective on it. You know, the, the project risk slide I showed has an awful lot of examples of risks that are that are pertinent for both oil and gas and, and offshore wind. Absolutely the same at the highest level, and hopefully it's helping everybody get their project or their potential economics right to go and make their bids on the lead sale. Uh, you know, one of the key challenges that we always have to keep in mind, particularly here in the US, is the political challenge. And right now for offshore wind, we have tremendous alignment between federal, state, even local jurisdictions. Uh, that's awfully valuable and that doesn't always happen. And, you know, we're kind of a 5149 country where things flip during major elections. So. The timeline for project development is always longer than the political incumbency. So I always keep that in mind. Um, a couple of the other quick issues that I'd just like to touch on first is that oil and gas economics often allows oil and gas projects to go do an awful lot of the infrastructure development and recognize that they have to incur those costs themselves. Port development, development of a supply chain, a uh, skilled workforce often comes from the projects themselves, particularly in greenfield developments around the world, uh, because if, if they don't pay for it, it's not going to happen. Now, we've got this tremendous opportunity in the U.S. where all of these policies are aligning to help support that. So that's fantastic and, a, and a, you know, a, unbelievable to, to help improve area capability and local content for all of the different lease areas of offshore wind. The one other main difference, which everybody knows, but I'll just mention it, is Oil and gas has a much smaller footprint unless things go really wrong. And offshore wind has a much larger footprint on the ocean. And so the potential for conflict and the perceived conflicts with other ocean users are clearly going to be tremendously important to work through. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. And unfortunately, um, we have come to the top of the hour. Uh, Sharon, thank you very much for answering those questions in the chat. And thank you all again for your great presentations and to the audience for your uh, participation and for your uh, for your participation. 
They the link to this recording and all the slides are going to be sent to everyone who registered. And if Zach scrolls through, you'll see that there's going to be a biography and uh, contact information for each of them if you have any additional questions. So thank you again. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you, everybody.